This is Jehovah's Witness governing body member Kenneth Cook. Jehovah's Witnesses governing body is notorious for making horrifically terrible decisions that have historically protected child abusers, gotten people seriously injured, uh, ordered their people not to say the Pledge of Allegiance during a time when it wasn't really popular to not say the Pledge of Allegiance, literally, on their word, got people beaten to death. And that's just one example. You know what? You shouldn't have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I can agree with that. But this seems like a legal battle they should have fought before forcing their people to get the beat out of them, right? Just seems like it to me. So that's what the Jehovah's Witness governing body has notoriously done in the past. They've done a lot of other stuff. False prediction after false prediction, claiming the end would come in 1914 and then 1919, 1922, 25, 1975. I mean, it's just embarrassing at this point. And, of course, they continue to embarrass themselves. So I want to listen to Kenneth Cook, that's who this guy is, lay down some deeply embarrassing garbage for us. He actually did a video back in uh, February about the trans community. Now, I think I played this at the time. Let me just give you an idea of who the guy is. Listen to this clip, just a second of it. We see it in their so-called gay marriage. We see it in the gender blurring that the world is promoting. The world's not promoting any gender blurring, FYI. You don't have to be a man or a woman, they say. You can be whatever you feel like or choose to be. Really? What does Jehovah say about that? Look, here's the thing. I don't give a shit what their interpretation of what God says about that. I really couldn't possibly care less. You know what I've come to find? When I was a Jehovah's Witness, when I was inside the religion, I was told from birth that the end would be here any five minutes now. That was in 1989. Leading up to the year 2000, they claimed that the end would be here before the new millennium. I remember I was a Jehovah's Witness at the time. They said, well, see, you know, the millennium is not technically the year 2000. It's technically the year 2001. So it's possible it could still come before the millennium ends. Time comes and goes, nothing happens. 2014, they say... It'll be here before 2014, for sure, absolutely. It'll be here before you graduate. It kept going like that, on and on and on and on. I happen to know that that's what Jehovah's Witnesses have to say, or that's what they believe that Jehovah wants you to know. These people claim to be the arbiters of God on planet Earth, and they've gotten things wrong so many times, I don't know how they don't hang their head in shame. I have no idea how they continue to operate. How do they not retire and disappear from the face of the earth? Like, just disappear into some cabin somewhere in the middle of nowhere. That's what I would do if I were so colossally embarrassed the way that they've been. So, uh, honestly, I don't care what you think Jehovah says about something. Jehovah's not even God's name. I couldn't possibly care less what you think God thinks about something. Or you feel like or choose to be. Really? What does Jehovah say about that? At Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, he told the nation of Israel that, quote, a woman must not put on the clothing of a man, nor should a man wear the clothing of a woman. Oh, we're reading Deuteronomy. Okay, interesting. Well, in that case, might I divert your attention to Deuteronomy chapter 18, where it talks about false prophets. You remember that part? Just for good measure, let's play an old clip from Jehovah's Witnesses, just so we're on the same page with this. They had a false end times prediction all the way back in 1975. This is 1974 when this came out, well, I, I think, or 1970s anyway. Well now, as Jehovah's Witnesses, as runners, even though some of us have become a little weary, it almost seems as though Jehovah has provided meat in due season, because he's held up before all of us a new goal, a new year. Something to reach out for, and it just seems it's given all of us so much more energy and power in this final burst of speed for the finish line. And that's the year 1975. As one brother put it, stay alive to 75. They believed that if you could just stay alive to 1975, you wouldn't have to die because the end would come. 
So with that under our belt, understanding that they blatantly bald-faced lied about hearing God's word, telling them that the end would be here before 1975, let's read a chapter in Deuteronomy. This guy likes to quote Deuteronomy, right? Let's take a quick look here. I believe it's 23. I will raise up from them a prophet like you from, al- from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. Now, this is the role Jehovah's Witness governing body members claim for themselves. They claim to be the only prophets on planet Earth. They, are, uh, they say that no one else is capable of prophesying, only them and other anointed people, I think. I'm not super sure on that one. But a very small number of people is the point. That's why they are in charge of everything, you know, all the writing projects and everything, because they're hearing the voice of God. So they're telling people what they believe, whatever. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, but a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. He likes to quote the book of Deuteronomy to back up his points. Let's talk about the book, the book of Deuteronomy. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. That's pretty clear. That's pretty clear, right? I don't know how it could possibly be clearer. These people spoke presumptuously. They lied. They claim to hear the voice of God at the very least in 1975. I have a billion other examples. This is the one I have on hand right now. They lied to your face and are now quoting Deuteronomy and trying to use it to justify hate against other people. And where the clothing of a woman for anyone doing so is detestable to Jehovah your God. If that is how the creator feels about the switching of clothing, how much more detestable he must view the world's attempts to blur the lines of gender with false labeling. He has no idea. He has no clue, never did. And he claims special information, special status is given to him because he's anointed. Now, how do you get anointed? You just know. You just know. According to him, it just comes to you like in a dream. You just decide one day, I'm anointed and God speaks to me. Only they like to keep the cap really low. Only 144,000 people in all of human history are allowed to consider themselves anointed. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses passed that cap a long time ago and then started kicking people off the rolls because they realized that, you know, that would kind of poke a hole in the whole belief system. But he didn't kick himself off the rolls. He still claims to be anointed. He still claims to hear the voice of God to this day. And he claims all of the things that he's saying right now are from God himself. He is using God to inspire hate against other people, unjustifiably. So I wanted to listen to what he had to say here about political involvement, because what he just said was pretty politically involved, right? That was a really political statement that he just made back in February 2023. And this one came out, I think, yeah, March 2023. So let's listen to his counsel, quote unquote, on being too politically involved. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that being politically involved to any degree is wrong. So check this out. Today's printed comments consider how Satan has blurred people's view of Jehovah. Satan has blurred their... Okay, Jehovah is not God's name. I just want to put that on record. God's name is Yahweh. ...their view or blinded people by means of apostate teachings and by seeing to it that God's name has been removed from many copies of the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses wrote their own Bible, the New World Translation, and inserted Jehovah where it didn't belong. I mean, I'm talking like inserted the Tetragrammaton, the four letters that represent God's name. They inserted that where it doesn't belong. The Tetragrammaton is actually Y-H-W-H. There, there were no J's until like the 1400s, okay? Jehovah is not God's name. Never was. I don't want to get into a whole thing about God's name, but I have some stuff about it on my channel if you want to look it up. Or on my website, OMMorgan.com. You could probably just type in the search God's name and it'll pop something up for you. For this morning's discussion, we want to consider a related concern, and that is, what current and future events in Satan's world could blur our view of God's kingdom if we're not careful? With each point, we'll tie in the principle found in these words in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, where it says, I well know, O Jehovah, 
that man's way does they inserted the word jehovah there that's not the word that goes there that man's way does not belong to him it does not belong to man who is walking even to direct his step with this in mind we're going to look at how widespread protests political promises and claims of peace and security could distort our view of god's kingdom if we're not careful Right, so this peace and security thing, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that in the end, there's a Lincoln Park reference in there somewhere. In the end, like when, you know, Armageddon rolls around or whatever, there's going to be a, a cry for peace and security and everyone's going to feel safe and secure and all that other stuff. Uh, just completely made up all of it. First, widespread protests. When protests sweep through any country, there's often someone leading the way with a very loud or persuasive voice. True? Not always. Protests don't always have, like, direct leaders, right? Who was leading the Black Lives Matter protests? They were just kind of spontaneous things that popped up out of nowhere. I mean, George Floyd was the symbol for a lot of that stuff back in uh, 2019 and 2020, I think. But it wasn't really being led, right? Like, it, it feels like a little thing, but let's just be sure that we're drilling down and being very, very accurate. They like to distort things. They like to start with the grain of truth and twist it around until it's unrecognizable. I want to make sure we're being accurate about everything here. And their message usually touches on something that many see as an injustice. Whether the protest involves dozens, hundreds, or thousands of people, most of the protesters are followers, and they repeat a message or slogan. Sheeple. The problem is that the solutions they seek are human solutions. Well, we live in a society that requires some form of governance or social cohesion. So yeah, obviously, humans living in a human world are going to try to use human methods to fix problems right now. Now, if you want to believe that God is coming back any five minutes now, go nuts. But guess what? You still have to set up a system of governance until he does. That's just how it works. That's why the Pope exists. That's why there is a structure within the Baptist Church and all of that other stuff. Recall Jeremiah's words, it does not belong to man even to direct his step. What danger do such protests pose for true Christians? They pose absolutely no danger whatsoever. But Jehovah's Witnesses are obsessed with the idea that being politically involved to any degree, any degree at all, is a bad thing, even though he just, like last month, spent time talking about how evil trans people are. The danger is this, if we get caught up in the spirit of popular protests, even slightly supporting a cause, even silently within our heart, we could find our view of God's kingdom growing dim. You, you can't even take a position. You can't even think to yourself, I feel like this side is right or whatever. Okay, interesting. What in turn could that lead to? Well, when people in the world lack clear direction or hope, their hearts often start to be filled with anger and rage. A servant of God can feel such things too if he or she loses sight of the kingdom. Consider for a moment what happened to those who followed after King David's son, Absalom. The Bible explains that Absalom objected to his father's rulership. Dude, this is a story I haven't heard in, like, years. Why, why do they bring up obscure examples? Why don't they give examples most people know? But he did more than that. Through cunning words and actions, he gathered a following. You can read about what he did at 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verses 2 through 6. He promised the people justice. And verse 6 says that Absalom kept stealing the hearts of the men of Israel. In other words, the people got caught up in his message. Eventually, those who joined him turned violent, and the outcome was disastrous. Yes, even the heart... So, if you're facing injustice, doesn't matter how bad it is, to avoid any kind of violent outcome, you should just avoid protesting at all. Just let people walk all over you, live in this horrific world where things are going to be absolutely terrible for you. It doesn't really matter. Just whatever it takes to not get involved politically to any degree. Genius. Parts of those who worship Jehovah can be stolen or captured or, as today's text says, led astray for a misguided or bad purpose. So that is the danger. And we can be certain that Satan knows it. There's no question that Satan is right now using various messages of protest to direct people away from the real solution, God's kingdom. 
Wow, that's interesting. So who's protesting right now? Who is protesting in March 2023, I wonder? Jehovah's Witnesses, particularly the governing body members, have a tendency to support structural power. They support hierarchies. Uh, whoever is in power in that moment, they will make sure that they maintain that authority. I'm not familiar with any protests happening right now in March 2023. You know, I, this could have been the result of Donald Trump suppo claiming to be arrested or something. I don't know. What are they even talking about? I have no clue. A lot of pro slash anti trans protests at the moment. Yeah, that's very possible. You're right, Emily Neptune, that could be. Seems likely based on how they feel about the LGBT community that it's most likely about the trans community. That's probably true. Tim will cast his net wide to try to capture some of Jehovah's people if possible. To avoid that and remain focused on the kingdom, we must not forget what Isaiah 42 and verse 1 promises about Jesus. There it foretells that he will bring justice to the nations. He will, not humans. Okay, great. But while we're waiting, we need to find some way to live in this world. So, yeah. As king of God's kingdom, Jesus is the one who will bring what sinful humans can never bring, real justice for people. Fine, but we can at least reach for it in the meantime. People are suffering out there. They fight court battles all the time. Jehovah's Witnesses famously fought in the court battle um, Barnett v. something or other. It was the one that determined that you're not allowed to force somebody to say the Pledge of Allegiance, basically. I actually knew the woman who fought in that legal battle. Lawyers came to visit her in her old age from time to time. I remember. Gaithy was her name. Gaithy Barnett. And uh, her sister's name, I didn't know her sister. She's in another congregation. Her sister was Christy, maybe? I don't remember. Anyways, Jehovah's Witnesses fight in legal battles from time to time is the point, right? Why is he up in arms about the idea that you'd try to get justice? Why is he up in arms about the idea that people would try to protest or fight legal battles? This makes no sense. They do that. We need Bible man to solve these problems. That's what we really need. We don't need Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't need anything else. No televangelists, no preachers, no pastors. We need Bible man. Now this is what I call dressing for success. We, we spell of truth. truth. We need a way spell to truth desperately. Of yes, I love it. Shoes of peace. Shield of faith. Helmet of salvation. Full armor sequence complete. And the sword of the spirit. Cypher, do I look okay to you? Yeah, you look like a superhero, which is what you are. Why? Oh, huh. No reason. Eunice, I'll take the tunnel bike. Track me. Dude, we, this is the superhero we need. We don't need Jehovah's Witnesses. We need Bible man now. Somebody get on that. Anyway, let's keep listening to Jehovah's Witnesses spread their nutter buttery as usual. Is there no end to the false promises that people will make when they want power? Oh, of course they're going to give false promises. Absolutely. Are you expecting any less? And even when politicians try to fulfill some of their promises, they often fall short on the wisdom and the resources to do it effectively. Yeah, absolutely. That's why you have to fight and drill down and battle and try to get what you need. Don't let them get away with corruption or taking from you. Political powers can only provide short-term human solutions at best. Uh, sure, sure, fine. I'll accept that. But guess what? We live in a human world right now. When we get to God's world, we can follow his rules. Until then, we have to work in this political system. The Bible even says this. Why is he battling this? Why is he arguing like this? Why is he refusing to accept that you have to get involved politically to make this place better for everybody around you? Jehovah's Witnesses get involved politically all the time as a governing body. They are in and out of court constantly battling all kinds of stuff. 
rules, regulations, and taxes, and flag salutes, and blah, 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 all of it. Military service, and, and all kinds of stuff. Not just in the U.S., worldwide. They argue in courts worldwide. They understand the importance of getting involved politically. Why are they still leaning into this, this, this battle? against Jehovah's Witnesses getting involved politically. You know why, actually? It's because they don't want Jehovah's Witnesses to have anything to argue with each other about. They want them to be in perfect sync with each other. They want personality clones. Really, this is a hallmark of a cult. This is exactly what you'd expect to see from cult members. And it is exactly what we see from Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, if there is some kind of political argument taking place within the ranks of Jehovah's Witnesses, they are, there can't be the level of cohesion and the level of cloned personality, for lack of a better term, than the level that they want in their people. That's why they forbid political positions. Not because they think it's wrong, not because they think you shouldn't, you know, you don't need the political system, you need God instead. Not because of any of that. It's because they don't want their people arguing over anything. They want them in perfect sync with each other. They often cave in to popular and immoral thinking. Their thoughts are so distorted that they have difficulty seeing right from wrong. So instead of allowing their people to kind of have a free mind, they're telling their people what moral position they should have. They're explaining the morals to the membership. They're not giving them an opportunity to think this through themselves. They face long-term problems, including social unrest, that they cannot permanently solve, and no amount of money can fix it for them. Again, we... Well, that's not strictly true. If you have unlimited money, you can solve any problem. Again, we recall Jeremiah's words, it does not belong to man even to direct his step. When the rulers of ancient Rome tried to put down social unrest, they gave many things to the people for free. Food, entertainment, and many services were free. I guess he's taking a stand against socialism, right? I mean, that's not what socialism is or communism, but I find it fascinating to hear the same talking points come out of Jehovah's Witness governing body members as I do coming out of evangelical like Kenneth Copeland and stuff like that. That is really interesting. I'm actually going to write this down and come back to this later. God, this dude gives an anti-trans message and then an anti-socialism message from a propagandistic perspective. This is fascinating. Kenneth Cook, governing body member of Jehovah's Witness, is very obviously sinking neck deep into political propaganda right now, right? Is it just me? It seems clear as day. He's falling right into political propaganda. They gave many things to the people for free. Food, entertainment, and many services were free or very cheap. They called it bread and circuses. See, that was their formula to appease the people and gain their allegiance. But like the governments of today, that man-made empire was in gradual decline. And the humans in charge had no long-term answers, only short-term offerings. Dude, think about what the guy's saying right now. He is repeating the exact same propaganda that you hear coming from the far right in different language. And just like today, it was an empire in decline, i.e. America is falling. America is being destroyed by the trans people, by the socialists and the communists. The ideas he's espousing right now are directly from the far right. This is crazy. From a group that detests at least publicly, political positions or, or political whatever, this is really crazy to listen to. Now, it's likely that the early Christians in Rome and elsewhere benefited from some of the things that the empire provided. Food, water, good roads, and so forth. Still, those early Christians needed to remain focused on the Lord and on his promised kingdom. Otherwise, their view of things could have become distorted. So they shouldn't receive free things from the government, or should they? And they might have been pulled into compromising their faith by giving undue glory to the empire. How short-sighted that would have been. That empire in Rome would have eventually, and did eventually turn against those Christians. Today, we too may benefit from some of the things that the nations are doing. But like the early Christians, we must never allow the kingdom to become out of focus in our minds and hearts. What? Right, well, you can still focus on the kingdom or whatever and also still vote 
right? I mean, what he's saying here does not preclude being involved politically. He's not giving us the real reason why he doesn't want Jehovah's Witnesses voting or getting involved politically. Just tell us. You want us to be clones of each other, right? You just want everybody to act and think exactly the same way, and you want them to get their morals from you. Not from their own conscience, but from you. This is actually from something called the influence continuum. I don't know if you guys have heard of this before. It delineates constructive influence and destructive influence and gives us an idea of the difference between the two. Let's just take a quick look. If you take a look here at the influence continuum, on the left side is constructive or healthy influence and on the right is destructive or unhealthy influence. No matter what you're doing, no matter who you're talking to, no matter what organization you're working with, there will be some level of influence between you and them. So the question is, are they exerting healthy or unhealthy, destructive or constructive influence on you? On an individual level, if we're talking about person to person, are they encouraging a false identity, like a cult identity, almost like a clone? Or are they uh, encouraging you to be your authentic self? Is your relationship with them conditional? Is it conditional based upon the condition that you remain a member of the, the group or that you continue to believe the same way that they do? Are their beliefs built on hate or compassion, doctrine or conscience? Should you build your moral beliefs off of what they have to say in their books or what they want you to believe, like Kenneth Cook is doing here, or do they want you to build your morals off of your own conscience? Do they encourage solemnity, fear, and guilt, or creativity and humor? Dependency and obedience, or free will and critical thinking? That's fundamentally the difference between constructive influence and destructive influence. And this doesn't just apply to cults, by the way. This applies to all kinds of different people. This is on an individual level, and fundamentally, at its core, a cult is an abusive relationship between a group or, or a set of leaders and an individual. So for that reason, you can find a lot of the qualities listed on the influence continuum and on the bite model. You can find those qualities or traits in an, a manipulator or an abuser, you know, an abusive ex or something. You find a lot of the same stuff. This is the clearest example of him convincing people to follow doctrine for their morals rather than their own conscience that I've ever seen. Doesn't get much clearer than this. From some of the things that the nations are doing, but like the early Christians, we must never allow the kingdom to become out of focus in our minds and hearts. What will help us to do this? We're helped when we remember that Jehovah and his son are in charge of man's future. The solutions they offer are permanent. The promises they have made will be fulfilled. Any second now, right? Any five minutes. This is coming from Jehovah's Witnesses governing body members. So forgive me if I have trouble believing you. You've made one too many false predictions for my taste. If we keep that focus, then when this man-made system turns against God's people, it will have no hold on us. As God's word directs, we submit to man's rulership where it does not conflict with God's rule. But in following that direction, we're not entrusting our future to political promises and favors. We entrust our future to God's kingdom alone. The more that the nations try to appease the people through political promises, the more determined we must be to keep the kingdom in focus, the real solution. That leads us to the third thing that could blur or distort our view of God's kingdom. Wait, are we going through a list right now? I, what were number one and two? I'm so lost. Like this dude, either I'm a bad listener that's very possible or he's a bad speaker because i don't remember him even starting with a list what was this list supposed to be <laughs> namely when the nations are saying peace and security right so jehovah's witnesses that peace and security line there they believe that in the end like right before the great tribulation and then armageddon they think that the world is going to say we have peace and security there will be no wars blah 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 and then it's all going to start. Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be hunted like, I don't know. They're, they're going to be hunted. I'll just leave it at that. Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be hunted in basements and all kinds of stuff. They've done some ridiculous dramatizations to portray this. And, you know, then the end will come, basically. So when you hear cries for peace and security, that's a sign the end is here. Still haven't heard those cries, of course. 
they want you to believe it's still going to be here any five minutes, despite that fact. At First Thessalonians 5.3, God's word foretells that whenever it is that they, the political powers, are saying peace and security. There you go. Then sudden destruction is to be instantly on them. Why will sudden destruction come? Because human governments are not the solution. It's the best we've got, though. We, we have to work with what we've got, right? And it's unethical for you to not be involved to some degree in this whole system. Despite having heard the kingdom message, the nations will not stop trusting in themselves to solve their problems. That's they have no choice, of course. At some point, the political powers will arrogantly be saying peace and security in a way that fulfills 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Jehovah knows how and when that will prove to be. Yet no matter how much or how loudly the nations will be saying it, they cannot change this fact. It does not belong to man who is walking, even to direct his step. Fine, that may be the case. But you know what? They've been saying for 100 years, more than that, honestly, 150 years now. The end would be here any five minutes, and they've made some pretty specific predictions. Now, if we gave up on government entirely uh, until God came back or whatever, all the way back then, the world would be in shambles. We have to get involved politically. We have no choice. And he knows this. He knows there's a flaw in his logic. He knows that this is a nonsensical position to hold, that he's defending right now. But if he doesn't defend this position, his people will find themselves taking political positions, which will lead to a lack of cohesion and arguments within the religion. And they can't have that. They need perfect, obedient clones in this religion. Just as humans cannot simply flap their arms and fly, so too humans cannot rule themselves successfully. I don't know. I've got to say, I think humans have been, you know, uh, ruling over themselves plenty successfully. I think humans have done a fantastic job, all things considered. Could be worse, right? Could be a lot worse. We could live in like an anarcho-capitalist state. That'd be a nightmare. So as things move ahead toward the Great Tribulation, we must not allow ourselves to be fooled, no matter how convincing the speeches and boasts from the nations may sound. And we will not be fooled if we refuse to get caught up in popular protests that seek human solutions to the world's problems, if we refuse to place our trust in political promises, and if we refuse to be fooled by the nation saying peace and security. So no matter what Satan's world promotes, in the news, on social media, or elsewhere, we're convinced that God's kingdom alone is the solution. What can we do to keep that focus? Keep preaching the good news of the kingdom to people, including the warning about what is coming. Okay, that's kind of interesting. He, he mentions that, including the warning, i.e. go knock on doors. You're supposed to go door knocking every so often. Like, really, they want like 40 hours a week, but they know they're not going to get that out of people who already work full time. So I used to get about 10 hours per week of door knocking back in the day. Well, here's where it gets interesting. In the end, quote unquote, when Jehovah's Witnesses believe that like we've crossed a line into the Great Tribulation or whatever, Jehovah's Witnesses say they're going to switch from a message of good news to judgment, i.e. the doors are going to be closed. You're not going to be able to join anymore once Jehovah's Witnesses determine that the end is here or that, you know, the, the Great Tribulation is here and that the end is on its way or whatever. They believe that the doors are going to close, you won't be able to join, but they're still going to be expected to spread the word. It's just instead of telling people they want them to join the religion, they're going to tell them you're going to die. They're going to go to their door, knock on it, and when they open it, they're going to say, you are straight and you had a chance to join and you rejected it. Good job, dumbass. And then walk away, minus the swears, probably. Then walk away. That's the switch from good news to judgment. So keep a lookout for that. When Jehovah's Witnesses switch from asking for you to join their religion, when they switch from that to telling you that you're just out of luck and that's it, ooh boy, that's going to be interesting when that happens. That's not going to make them very popular, I'll tell you that much. Remember that Jehovah and his son are the ones who are in charge of man's future and never allow Satan and and I'm in charge of your mom personally. And never allow Satan and his world to weaken your faith and blur your view of God's kingdom. And always have this in mind. It's stated in Isaiah chapter 26 and verses 3 and 4, where it says of Jehovah. Again, Jehovah is not God's name. It makes me cringe every time I hear them say this. You will safeguard those who fully lean on you. You will give them continuous peace because it is in you that they trust. 
Trust in Jehovah forever, for Jah Jehovah is the eternal rock. Just cringy stuff, man. These people are absolutely terrible. I mean, the governing body members specifically, I mean. I feel so bad for the individual Jehovah's Witnesses who are stuck in this religion, cannot find their way out for the life of them. Because if they do leave, they lose every friend and family member they've ever had. All of them, permanently. I know, because I did. There's no way out, and that's very intentional on the on Jehovah's Witnesses' part, on the governing body members' part. It's just wrong, man. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Viking EBJ, I discovered that a friend of mine has my book of Bible stories. They didn't realize it was a, it was JW propaganda. Actually, it's funny you mention that because I have that pulled up like right now. I <laughs> it's right here. I actually created an ebook out of it, uh, and I put a lot of work into this ebook. This is the book. I, I've been thinking about going through it on my Telltale Reads YouTube channel. I think that would be really interesting, right? These pictures are are absolutely horrifying and bring back a lot of memories from back in the day. I used to read this book all the time, and it's straight up disturbing stuff, dude. Straight up disturbing stuff. So, anyways, yeah, really interesting to look back at this book now straight from Jehovah's Witnesses and dude look at this who would what kind of a monster would put a picture of a dude grabbing somebody by the throat like this in a uh, children's book like this I used to look at this and what's worse my dad used to do this shit to me so it made it that much more horrific like what the fuck were they thinking putting this shit in here this isn't even the worst there's even worse stuff in here the story of Isaac being sacrificed by Abraham this woman being turned into a pillar of salt? Like, what? Why put this in a children's book? Really? Let me find some of the really bad ones. Hold up. The one about Jezebel, dude? Oh, my God. Jezebel being pushed out of the thing? Or Moses closing the Red Sea over top of people? Horrific stuff, dude. Horrific stuff, straight up. I was looking for Jezebel. This is Jezebel. They pushed her out a window. What a disturbing story to tell people, right? To tell kids. What is wrong with them? Why would they do that? So anyway, the point is Jehovah's Witnesses' propaganda is just straight up disturbing for real.